Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we focus on power, the power of films to get our message across internationally. First, we'll speak with Norbert Sutinek, director of the International Uranium Film Festival, which is currently taking place in Berlin, Germany. Then, Christian Brun, executive producer of The Man Who Saved the World, a deeply moving Hollywood-connected documentary about the Russian soldier in charge of launching a nuclear strike and what happened in 1983 when Russian computers suddenly showed five incoming U.S. nuclear warheads and his was the finger on the retaliatory button. Talk about nuclear power. That's what this film has got. Plus, our regular numbnuts of the week, activist shout-outs, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Doc, and cover report, and more information on nuclear matters than every Hollywood film produced in the last year contains. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, September 29, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. According to Japanese researchers, Fukushima's reactor number two could have suffered a complete meltdown. Researchers have been monitoring the Daiichi nuclear power plant since April, but say they have found few signs of nuclear fuel at the reactor's core. More bad news out of Fukushima, as details found in the recent International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, report on the Fukushima disaster show that the events at Unit 5, which we never talk about, Unit 5, were much more dire than the impression given to the public. Now they tell us. Turns out Unit 5 was in a maintenance outage during the initial disaster that left it in a configuration with no containment. There's a very long, very technical article about this that you can find on fukuleaks.org. Iori Muchizuki and Fukushima Diary report that, according to Japan's Nuclear Regulatory Authority, Tokyo still has fallout from the Fukushima nuclear disaster. In a report released on August 31st, 0.88 millibecquerels per cubic meter of cesium-134 and 137 fell onto Tokyo this past July. The cesium-134 is a marker for radioactivity released by the Fukushima facility. Other radionuclide density was not reported. Remember the rains that hit northeast Japan on September 11 and carried away, here's the latest count, 439 large plastic bags that contained radioactive soil, grass, and tree branches from the decontamination process, redistributing the deadly wealth. Now the Environment Ministry of Japan says it will better manage garbage bags holding radioactive soil and weeds in Fukushima Prefecture and that nearly 400 of them have been recovered. That's the good news. The bad news? Most of them were empty. The official's big fix is going to be to move the bags to high ground or fix the bags with ropes to prevent them from being washed away by heavy rain and typhoons. Don't hold your breath. Japan's Ministry of Health, Labor, and Welfare announced high levels of cesium-134 and 137 were detected from mushrooms that were already sold. The highest density was 420 becquerels per kilogram from Shimiji. Japan's limit is 100 becquerels per kilogram, but hey, here in the U.S., we can do 1,200. So ship those puppies over here, and they will be legal. Not healthy, just legal. Dairy farmers in Fukushima, who were forced to suspend business following the start of the nuclear accident there in 2011, are restarting the dairy industry with 580 cows. Dairy is among the most contaminated of food sources because cows eat grass upon which has settled any fallout that came from the skies or came down from rain. And now... Nuclear hot seat. Nuclear 
Toshiaki Endo, who is the Japanese minister for the Tokyo Olympics in 2020, said on Tuesday, September 29th, that locations outside of Tokyo, including disaster hit Fukushima Prefecture, should host five proposed sports if they are added to the program of the 2020 Games in Tokyo. These five sports are baseball for men and softball for women, karate, skateboard, Sports climbing and surfing. Surfing in the ocean outside of Fukushima. What could go wrong? Endo has been advocating Fukushima's hosting of the Olympic events as a way to highlight the region's reconstruction from the 2011 earthquake and tsunami, while not bothering to mention the still ongoing crisis with the melted down nuclear reactors that are still bubbling away there on the coast. Endo said, I'd like to make a request for baseball or softball qualifying rounds to be held in regional towns and cities if possible. Here's my request to the International Olympic Committee. Do not repeat not sanction these sports for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. I'm sorry, my apologies to the athletes, but if you value your life and your genetic future, It's just not worth a hunk of metal hung on a cord around your neck, no matter what color that metal may be. And that's why you, Toshiaki Endo, and probably even you, the International Olympic Committee, are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. And we are sorry to hear from Days Japan, sad news, that a little girl who enjoyed going to the Kumino Sato Beach Camp for Fukushima kids that took place in Okinawa passed away from brain tumors at the end of last year. She was just over a year old at the time of the Fukushima accident. How dare they try to say that nobody died? Over to the U.S., where for the third time this year, there has been an accident at the Honeywell Uranium Processing Plant in Metropolis, Illinois, near the Kentucky border. A semi truck transporting yellow cake uranium caught on fire at the Honeywell gates. This qualified as a Nuclear Regulatory Commission alert, which is the second of a four tiered system for determining whether or not it's time to kiss your posterior. Behind. Up two, two from the top. The Pilgrim Nuclear Power Plant in Massachusetts may be shutting down because the Nuclear Regulatory Commission downgraded the safety rating of the 43 year old plant, naming it one of the three least safe units among the nation's 99. And with multi million dollar repairs now on the line, Energy Corporation, the slumlord、uh, conglomerate that owns Pilgrim, doesn't know whether they want to ante up the money or not. Shut it down. Shut it all down. An investigation by San Diego's NBC TV affiliate has found evidence of radioactive debris on the beach at San Onofre and labeled their handling of nuclear waste sloppy. High radiation levels in trailers endangered Southern California Edison employees so badly that at times the Nuclear Regulatory Commission inspectors refused to perform routine radiation surveys. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has given 20 year extensions on life support for the Sequoia reactors in Tennessee. 34 year old Unit 1 can run until 2040, and 32 year old Unit 2 is allowed to run until 2041. Would you trust your life to a car that old? And the Hope Creek reactor in New Jersey, just 138 miles from Manhattan, experienced a scram. An emergency shutdown on September 28th following a trip of both reactor recirculation pumps. That's the cooling system. We'll have today's featured interviews in just a moment, but first, well, regarding Nuclear Hot Seat's website, I guess computer things always take longer than one expects. And having to restore the database from our website of over 220 audio recordings with supporting material is proving to be much more complex than anyone anticipated. 
What we've got as a website so far is still way too glitchy to be able to post and make available, but we are continuing to work diligently towards resolution of all the issues. So I want to say, first of all, to all of you, thank you for your patience. We'll get to this as soon as we can. We will get this up as soon as we can. And for those of you who have donated to the Nuclear Hot Seat site to cover expenses for the website fix, thank you again for all of your support. It could not have even been attempted without your generous donations. We are now less than $100 away from hitting the amount that we needed to raise to cover this work. Even in its glitchy form, this new site is better looking, more functional, far more searchable, and more secure than ever before. And we still have that temporary landing page at NuclearHotSeat.com where you can access download links to the last few weeks of the show. That's where you'll also find that secure link to make a donation, either through PayPal or directly from your credit or debit card. So let's close this campaign out, at least from the financial side of it. If you have ever thought of donating to Nuclear Hot Seat, please do it now. Any amount is appreciated, and no amount is insignificant. Every donation, no matter the size, is a sign of your caring about the show, and that alone helps keep the show and me going. So please don't wait. We are very, very, very close to having the full amount of money necessary. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com to find the secure donate link. If you prefer to not donate online, you can email me for a snail mail address to send your donation. Know that I am deeply touched, not only by your generosity, but by the messages that I have received from you, the listeners, as well. So whatever you can do to help us get over this last little hump, I thank you in advance. This week, Nuclear Hot Seat is focusing on films, starting with the International Uranium Film Festival. It is again screening films on all aspects of the nuclear issue and have them from around the world, including Germany, Japan, Italy, France, Macedonia, Spain, Denmark, Brazil, Poland, Austria, India, Ukraine, Ireland, Tajikistan, Australia, and the United States. I caught up with the festival's director, Norbert Suchinek, who's in Berlin from his home base in Rio, between his responsibilities with the film festival in order to find out the latest and get a rundown on just a few of the films being shown this week. Norbert Suchinek, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. I'm glad to be back in L.A. <laughs> <laughs> but only virtually, because right now we're talking, and you are in Berlin, for the current iteration of the International Uranium Film Festival, which you created and you produce in so many locations. What is going on currently in Berlin? How is it going? What is going on at the moment is uh, we are screening at the moment one beautiful film about the Chernobyl accident. It's a movie. And it's a very romantic movie about one of the soldiers, a heavily contaminated soldier who fell in love in a nice girl who was still living in the abandoned city of Chernobyl. So what happens now? So this is a drama. It's a drama, yes. What country is it from? Ukraine. And it's a new production, and of course, uh, we will show it in other places too. And today, it's the first time that the film is shown in Berlin with German subtitles. How many films do you have in this film festival in Berlin? We have now exact uh, 29 films. And you're going to be showing them over what period of time? We started last week on September 24, and we will have uh, the last screening next week in September 13. It's six days. And on the seventh day, you're exhausted and fly back to Rio. Uh, yes, at the seventh day. 
What is the buzz that's being created? Is there a particular film or are there films that are showing up to spark interest beyond just a few hardcore anti-nuclear people, but where there's really interest in the film as a film? Most of the films which that we selected are not only for nuclear hardcores. They are for everybody. Especially the first film that we showed that was our opening film was The Man Who Saved the World. That's the one I wanted to talk about. Tell us about this film and what it entails. Well, first, it was a great opening. We had the festival was uh, overbooked. <laughs> and it's, uh, of course, it was because one of the actors in the film was Kevin Costner. But the film is about a real hero, not about a hero from the cinema. The film is about Stanislav Petrov, a Russian soldier who was in the year 1983 in charge of the red button. The red button to press if the Soviet Union would have been attacked by atomic bombs from the United States. He was in charge to start the atomic war. In September 1983, the computers in Russia said, well, we are attacked by six atomic bombs coming from the United States of America. And he had 15 minutes to decide, is it a real attack or is it just a computer error? That's quite an edgy place to be and a great place to pitch a movie. You're saying this is a true story, but this was not done as a documentary. It was done as a drama. No, it was done as a documentary, but uh, we say a doc fiction. And with Kevin Costner in it, did he appear for this? <laughs> he was really in it. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, did he, did he show up for the opening, or is there a chance oh, to get him for sorry. a future opening? Yes. No, unfortunately, we had not uh, the time to invite him for the showing in Berlin. But I assure you, we will try to invite him for the opening of the festival in L.A., which well, we want to do with the film, too. Because the showing was so amazing. The people had tears in their eyes. They were so impressed by it, about this real hero, Petrov, in the film. The film is very, very moving, very moving, extremely moving. That's one of the things that film can do as a medium that so often is lacking from our discourse in the movement, and that is bring up the emotional connection to what is being discussed in a way that people can communally experience it. I understand that you had an Indian filmmaker who showed up who also brought a very powerful film with him. Can you tell us a bit about that one? Well, that film from Pravid, it's a road movie. He simply goes from uh, one nuclear power plant to the next over all of India to show what happens over there, what happens uh, with the population around all the places. And it's an easy movie, easy made, but it's powerful because it's shocking. Everybody knows if you watch films like Pandora's Promise, or if you watch the news, everybody thinks nuclear power is clean and safe. But this film shows nuclear power is dirty, very dirty, and it kills people around. And it shows, especially when he goes to the uranium mining places in Jadugoda, in the northeast of, of India, it shows not only the miners are contaminated, the whole population around is contaminated. All people are suffering. And Pravid, he himself, he's, he confessed until he was, I think, 25, 26 years old, he believed in nuclear power. He is a journalist, well educated, and worked also for the nuclear industry. And he was living, or he's still living in, in Vienna, so he speaks German very well. So we had very, very good discussion after the film with him. The thing that impressed me when I did have the opportunity to attend the last International Uranium Film Festival, which was up in Quebec City, is that 
one at a time, the films provided an up-close and personal and very informed view of specific problems in different parts of the world. It wasn't being filtered through the news media. It was the activists and the people on the front lines being able to say to a camera and through that camera the rest of the world what was really going on for them. How do you find your submissions for the Uranium Film Festival and who is this open to? If I understand it right, you talk about the film submissions. Right. Where do you find the films? How do they come to you? Because you really are represented genuinely all over the world with the films that you present. I do not find the films. The films find us. Like every film festival, we just make our call for entries and spread out some news, some press releases, and the films are coming in. We have already a new program for the next year. There are that many films coming out dealing with the issues? Yes. yes. On the horizon, in terms of the films, what do you see coming up, either here in Berlin or, and we'll talk about it, the next time the festival will take place? What do you see coming up that we should really be aware of? In terms of a film that has come in where you immediately respond, yes, this is powerful. This is what people need to be seeing. For the next year, 2016, this question comes too early because, unfortunately, this year I'm still working with the old films <laughs> from 2015. We have uh, received at the moment 40 or 50 films for the next year, but I couldn't watch not one of it at the moment. They are still in the, in the queue to be watched after Berlin and after Florianopolis because after Berlin I have a break of two days in Rio and then I go further south of Brazil to a special uh, event in Florianopolis where we have three days festival there together with a group of scientists and teachers from South America. I couldn't say no. All of this is fabulous because I'm certainly dedicated to helping media get out because it's one thing for us to say one to each other, nukes aren't good, and go into that discussion. It's a whole other thing when it can be put into a dramatic structure in a storytelling process, yes. in a drama, or into a documentary that just condenses all the information. And full disclosure, you and I have been working together to bring the festival next year into the belly of the beast, as it were, in the film industry, and that is here in Los Angeles. Tell people what the vision is for what we wish to create next year here in L.A. We want to create a dream. The big dream that I had, it started 2006, to bring good nuclear films to the real big screen. We have to bring them back to Hollywood because good nuclear films started in Hollywood with films from Stanley Kramer. That would be the movie On the Beach. With films with Jane Fonda, The China Syndrome. Good nuclear films started and during the 90s it was forgotten. Now we have to bring them back to Hollywood. And it's, it's funny, today, because our film festival is in a special quarter in Berlin, Weissensee, it's in East Germany, and this quarter, before the Second World War, was called Little Hollywood, because it's full of film studios. And have you had response from filmmakers in Germany coming to see these films to perhaps be influenced in the choices they make of their next project? Yes, yes. Every day we have German filmmakers visiting the festival and watching movies. About a one movie, of course, I've forgotten. You have to watch out one special movie for next year. It will be a movie by, by me. <laughs> it will be a movie about depleted uranium weapons. It's uh, a movie that I hope that I can finish this year in December. I already filmed it in New Mexico last year, and it's a film about Damasio Lopez, one of the first persons in the world that 
fought against the use of depleted uranium weapon. And he will come to, to Rio in October so that we can finish the work together. Wonderful. What are the range of topics represented by the current festival? We've certainly mentioned the man who saved the world. By the way, is that one going to be shown in Los Angeles as well as part of the it festival? Should. Of course, of course. So what are some of the other topics that have been covered, the other aspects of the issue that have come to the fore, either issues based on countries or based on different subject matter within the nuclear context? Well, of course, next year, 2016, we will face five years of Fukushima. So I think one of the focuses in L.A. will be Fukushima. We will start, I hope so, with uh, films about Fukushima in March. And the second focus, of course, we have 30 years of Chernobyl, so we should show films from Chernobyl. We will end with Rima Island. But we have to remember, we have to remember the wonderful film, The China Syndrome, because it changed the world. Yes, it did. Because I was at Three Mile Island and had not yet seen the film, it took me 16 years before I was not afraid of it enough to be able to watch it. And even then, it triggered very deep emotional responses to me. And I've used the film many times as a cornerstone to do speaking engagements in libraries, show the film, have the discussion with the audience afterwards. So these films have an afterlife that can continue to have tremendous impact on this issue and on people's perception of it. Yeah. Now, with you coming to Southern California, will there be any outreach or emphasis on issues dealing with California? For example, the shutdown of San Onofre, the problems we have with the Santa Susana Field Lab meltdown, and also Diablo Canyon, which at this time of speaking is still in operation, but we've got our fingers crossed that it will be shut down sometime very soon. Of course. Of course, it's a very important part, and I want to encourage everybody who made a video or uh, animation or any kind of stuff about nuclear power plants, nuclear issues, radioactivity in Southern California, please send your production, send your work to the Rain Film Festival. We are eager to watch it and maybe to screen it in L.A. Is there any submission process they need to go to that has a fee attached to it? No, we are, it's everything without fee. Just go to the website and read the entry form and send the DVD. And is there a time limit on it? The time limit is the last day of January. That's the last chance. So if people are currently working on films, and I know of three right now, that are being worked on dealing with Southern California issues. If they're working on it, they have October, November, December, January. They've got four months to crash down and finish it in time to get it to you for consideration for this new festival yeah. that will be taking place in the U.S. in Hollywood. Yes. Norbert Suchinek, thank you so much for the work that you have been doing for the last five years putting together the Uranium Film Festival, the International Uranium Film Festival. We, of course, look forward to it coming to Los Angeles. And for now, thank you for again being my guest on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you again, Libby. It was my pleasure. That was Norbert Suchinek, director of the International Uranium Film Festival. Filmmakers interested in participating in the 2016 festival can find information and the submission form at uraniumfilmfestival.org. I just love the way the universe operates. Shortly after I finished interviewing Norbert, I got a call from Kat Kramer. Kat is the daughter of famed film director Stanley Kramer, who directed On the Beach, among so many other wonderful films. Kat was inviting me to a screening that same night, hosted by the Los Angeles chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility, that was presenting the very film I had just been discussing with Norbert, The Man Who Saved the World. It's a documentary about Stanislav Petrov, the Russian soldier who, in 1983, held the fate of the world in his hands. 
Stanislav was in charge of Russia's nuclear launch facility when the computers showed that the United States had launched five warheads at his country. Protocol, nationalism, pressure from those in the control room, and the expectations of his position all pressured Stanislav to order the button be pushed that would start World War III and probably end life as we knew it on Earth. But he did not and he paid a tremendous price in his life for having done the right thing. The film blends documentary footage of the now septuagenarian former soldier, showing the devastation of what that experience did to his personal life, as well as his sometimes explosive relationship with the documentarians, his meetings in the United States with Walter Cronkite, Kevin Costner, Robert De Niro, and Matt Damon, his brief and underattended yet powerful speech at the United Nations, along with feature film worthy reenactments of what took place in that control room in 1983. Powerful yet understated, with an emotional kick that sneaks up on you, this film is already having an impact on the world, as you will learn from this next interview with the film's executive producer, Christopher Brune. We talked about how the production came about, and some mind-blowing specifics came to the fore on the impact of this film already in a world that has largely fallen into amnesia about the menace of nuclear bombs. Christian Brune, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You worked on The Man Who Saved the World. First of all, what was your position on the film, and how did you become involved with it? I am the executive producer of the film. I joined the project about five years ago. My good friend Peter Anthony in Copenhagen had started the film years ago, about nine years ago now, along with producer Jacob Staberg. They had been working diligently for years to do this documentary and doing all the research and interviewing people and filming. Um, and then about five years ago, we um, needed to wrap up the movie and so sort of change direction a little bit of how the film was put together, and uh, that's when I joined, along with uh, Mark Romeo, my producing partner. So Peter Anthony, the director, and Jacob Staberg, the producer, are out of uh, Copenhagen. So they had started this project about nine years ago. After they saw a little one-minute news clip on, on um, in Denmark and decided that Stanislav Petrov needed a little more than 60 seconds on the air. What did it take to track down Stanislav Petrov when there was first the awareness that this story existed and that he still existed? It turned out not to be so difficult to find him, but there was a little bit of investigation first to figure out if he was there, if he was still alive. And But there had been a couple of interviews and a couple of um, articles about him that they could go and, and talk to the journalists and figure out where he was. Um, so it wasn't as hard. It was just that in general there was really no information other than a few articles. There was no mainstream information about him out there. It seems shocking that someone who had done something so magnificent and so ultimately important had been virtually ignored by the world. Was that the case in the Soviet Union or was there more awareness of him and what he did in that country? There was no awareness, and even to this day, there is no awareness. Um, I think today it's somehow still an embarrassment to a military system. And on the other side of that is that the, the whole incident was classified for 15 years. So it wasn't until 1998 when it was declassified that anybody could talk about it. Peter began the shooting of this project, and we see at the beginning of the film that it does not seem that Stanislav Petrov is very amenable to the process. There's quite a bit of anger that's shown. Yet he decided to go through it. Was there a change in Stanislav's orientation as the film progressed? Yes. Stanislav definitely changed behavior over time as we were shooting the film. I think once you realize that Peter Anthony was really trying to tell the true story and that finally somebody was paying attention to Stanislav's past and the incident, 
he slowly over the years opened up and, and wanted to share the story and wanted to get it out. This is a guy who, for 15 years after going through one of the most traumatic experiences you can imagine, couldn't share it with anybody. Right? He, there was no outlet. He couldn't talk to anybody about it. So even after it was declassified, Stanislav, it took him a while to realize that he was allowed to talk about it. He would even turn away journalists who showed up at his store when they had when they heard about it. He would turn them away. He thought maybe they were testing him to see if he was going to give away state secrets. So it took a while for Stanislav to even come to terms with the fact that he could talk about it publicly. And then I think he also making sure that the story was told correctly because it has such a big and negative influence on his life. He wasn't keen on sharing any of that personal information in the beginning. And that really, to Peter Anthony's credit, is like what he spent years getting to and getting under the skin of, of Stanislav Petrov to get that personal side of the story. So when you do see in the film that Stanislav, in the beginning of the film and until throughout the film, gets upset and gets angry whenever we mention his mother and whenever we get into any sort of personal aspects of how it affected his life. He's just very uncomfortable with the whole situation. I think he hasn't come to terms with it yet, not to give anything away from the film. Of course, something happens in the film where he does come to terms with it. Um, but again, it, it was like a six-year process for Peter to work his way in there to build the trust and the confidence, and also just for Stanislav to change himself, you know? That was one of the things in watching the film that struck me as being so remarkable because we're all used to the big nuclear story, which can be so overwhelming. But here what we are shown is a very delicate, a very touching personal story that has huge resonance to the larger nuclear story. It was like the personal and the political blended in a way that felt seamless to me in the audience so that the ultimate moment at the end was truly deeply moving and deeply touching. This brings me to the point of the form of the film, which I know has confused a lot of the uh, critics who have seen it, and that is it's a documentary. You're shooting live footage of the actual man, but then you have segments in it which take us back into that Cold War era and what he actually went through as one after another five different nuclear bombs were reported by the computer system as coming towards Russia and the entire fate of the world rested on his shoulder. How did you come to that particular structure for the movie? I think it was clear during the filming of the documentary portion early on that there was more to the story and that it was a deeper, there was a deeper understanding of Petrov himself. But I think it became clear that we needed somehow to really show the intensity of what happened in that, in that war room to really understand the pressure and the amount of people around Stanislav who all, you know, saw the same information and came to the conclusion that it was a real attack and they needed to retaliate before it was too late. So it wasn't just Stanislav against himself and figuring out it was also him against a lot of people who were in a system where one is supposed to follow protocol and follow orders. So once we made the decision to go in and do a reenactment of what happened in 1983, we decided to really bring up the level of production and to make it seem like a regular film. All the way back to Earl Morris, documentarians have done recreations and sometimes they come with a slightly negative connotation and they're not so well made. I think Peter really pulled off something incredible here that just looks like a regular movie. And I think that informed the rest of the film. So the shooting style of the whole movie then became sort of a coherent cinematic feature film, if you will. I just suspended disbelief through the whole thing because, for me, form follows function. And you chose a form that allowed you to not only show the current person with the current footage, but, of course, there's no footage that exists of the actual event. So it put us back in that situation in a very deep and a meaningful and powerful way. Also in the film, in the documentary section, there's quite a bit of Hollywood connection. There's poor Matt Damon, unfortunately, does not come across that well in it. But one of the most moving portions for me was when he's sitting at a table with Kevin Costner in Costner's trailer on a set. 
and Costner is questioning him as to how many people would have died, what would have been the actual impact, how would this have played out. And in watching Costner, he's not moving his face, we're not seeing any response from him, but at the same time one gets a sense of exactly how deeply that information is impacting him. That was a moment when it became tremendously real for me. What did it take to get the cooperation of so many people within the Hollywood community to be filmed and be part of this documentary? Well, when we approached people to be in the film and people that Stanislav wanted to meet up with, once they knew who he was, mm -hmm. everybody wanted to be in there. There was not a question. Everybody embraced it. And, and Kevin Costner was one of the first people who, back in the late 90s, heard about the incident so he was hugely instrumental in bringing the story out and also getting him over to the UN and shine a light on it so he was definitely right away he was on board and wanted to meet with, with Stanislav. Matt Damon it's all done in a very loving kind of way just like a little funny joke in there but uh, they were very gracious Robert De Niro and then Matt Damon just to even meet with Stanislav. You've also received some impressive support in the making of the film and also since it has been concluded from people not only in the Hollywood community, but also people in the political world. Tell us some of the response, the early response that has come from the film and how you've been supported in getting it out. Well, we've gotten a tremendous amount of support from a lot of different groups, and, and it, it's it's a very interesting collaboration between people of and, and groups of all various kinds of backgrounds. So when we opened the film in New York last week, the president of the General Assembly of the United Nations came to open the film and, and, and give a introductory speech. And after the film during the Q&A, he, in fact, deemed the film to be so important that he wanted to... Um, endorse it so he gave us a, a personal letter that is addressed to all the delegates at the summit at the UN this week for, for all the world leaders so he is endorsing the film and a copy of the film is given to every head of state that's at the General Assembly this week we've also gotten a lot of faith and moral based organizations behind the film the Pope has been giving a copy of the film various other religious groups behind the film helping us to reach out and just really get the word out because as it turns out everybody can come together and agree on world peace and getting rid of weapons that can undo all of humanity how is the film currently being distributed and where does it go next in other words for the listeners of nuclear hot seat who are very motivated around this issue where can they go to see the film and when can they do so well, so we just opened the film last week in New York for one week, and it's in L.A. this week, ending on Thursday. So it's just a little initial run, a limited uh, release of the film that's going to lead up to a wider release in January. So from now till January, anybody who wants to get involved can contact us, and we can set up special screenings. We can really activate the grassroots movements to host screenings when the film comes out in January and just really get involved because the more people we get behind this, the more people we can inform about the dangers of nuclear weapons. So I really encourage that. And we also, from now until January, we're inviting Stanislav back to the U.S. Um, there's several groups that want to present him with peace prizes and we are working on a campaign to get him nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. So we're fundraising right now to get him back over here in, in either late October or early November. It's very exciting, and, and hopefully we can reunite him with Kevin Costner. That would be wonderful, and I can think of no one who deserves the Peace Prize more than Stanislav Petrov. The film also, I know, was just screened in the last week at the Uranium Film Festival, which is taking place right now in Berlin. And word that we heard was that it was tremendously well-received, that people were crying. There was a very powerful outpouring of emotion at the end of the film and in the discussion that followed. And it is also going to be featured in the Uranium Film Festival when it comes to Los Angeles. Right now, we are looking at doing so in March of next year, where, of course, it would be featured. And it would be lovely to get Stanislav Petrov here for that as well. Absolutely. Well, he loves to travel. He's 76 years old, but he's really appreciative now of the fact that people have started to care about this. 
And like I mentioned earlier in the interview, that he's not being recognized in, in Russia at all. You know, the movie hasn't come out there. There's very little, very little knowledge of who he is. So we're doing everything we can to spread the word and get it out and also get the film released in Russia. That would be spectacular. In essence, one might say that you and the other filmmakers are the men and perhaps women who saved the man who saved the world. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you to say, but it has definitely been a long journey, especially for for Peter Anthony and, and Jacob Stayberg in Denmark. It's been a, a nine-year journey, but I think we were all just overwhelmed with the support and, and also the reactions to the film. It really couldn't have been expected. Also, the times we're in right now, that nuclear weapons have once again come to the forefront of, of, of news and also something that we realize we all need to start worrying about again. Nine years ago, it was much less of an apparent issue than now it, of course, is. Um, we did a college tour of the film earlier this year at about 30 colleges. And what was so amazing to see was that your science departments, physics departments, theology, international study, peace study, global studies, they all came together and hosted these screenings, and they all, again, came together. So you have religion and science meeting and agreeing on at least something that we should all join up and try to get rid of these weapons. You know? So that and then just being in a theater with, with an audience to, who really respond and react to Stanislav's personal story. And I will say that what really, to me, makes the film so powerful and, and again, all to the credit of, of Peter Anthony is that he managed to mirror the two stories of the importance of what happened in 1983 and the importance of understanding the dangers of nuclear weapons, but mirroring that with the personal downfall of Stanislav Petrov, and then the redemption and all that in the film. But when people see the film, they come up afterwards and they say they've never seen anything put together in this particular way that is so emotionally impactful. It was very emotionally impactful. If people wish to learn more about the film and contact you, where can they go? Mm -hmm. They can go to the man who saved the world movie dot com and also on Indiegogo we have a the man who saved the world campaign where where people can contact me and they can also pitch in if they want to support our efforts to bring over Stanislav to the US. Here's hoping that we get a chance to see him and thank him in person very soon. And thanks to you, Christian Brune, Peter Anthony, and all the others who worked so hard to get this film together. And thank you for being my guest today on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you for having me. That was Christian Brune, the executive producer of The Man Who Saved the World. You can learn more about the film and contact him regarding booking a screening at the man who saved the world movie dot com one more movie note the physicians for social responsibilities nuke busters short film competition has announced its winners congratulations to jonathan deaton the student filmmaker who took home first prize and five thousand dollars for his four minute film about millennials and the nuclear bomb called join the conversation We'll be talking with some of the winners of this competition as soon as we can arrange the interviews. In the meantime, if you want to scope out these short films, and they're all terrific, by the way, go to psr.org slash nuclear-weapons slash nukebusters. Or just search around the site and put in nukebusters, one word, and it should come up. Activist shout out The people of St. Louis need our help. There's a petition on change.org that needs your signature. Here's what's going on. We covered it last week on Nuclear Hot Seat at Well. The Bridgeton Landfill in Bridgeton, Missouri, sits on 52 acres in a Missouri River floodplain that is home to a large underground fire. This fire is advancing towards illegally dumped radioactive waste in the contiguous Westlake landfill, which is an EPA Superfund site. A recently released fire report indicates that this fire may reach the radioactive waste in as few as three to six months. The report also warns of risk factors including site collapse, 
hydrogen explosion, and day lightning fire, which could disperse radioactive particulates throughout the greater St. Louis metropolitan area. The petition calls on Missouri Governor Jay Nixon to use his emergency declaration powers to mitigate and extinguish the fire and provide proper advance emergency planning for the people in the area. You can access this petition at change.org. Search for it under gov-j-nixon, like former President Nixon, no relation, and you'll find the petition there. Please sign. Please forward on your social media. And I just got to toot my own horn. I got a message earlier this week from Dr. Ian Farrelly in the U.K. I interviewed him on Nuclear Hot Seat number 217 just last month, and he had this comment. He said, Our radio podcast on child leukemias near nuclear power plants had some effect, I think. My website manager tells me my 2014 post on this suddenly received 555 hits from the U.S. in one week in September. Good news. I'll say that's good news. It absolutely made my day, if not my week. You can access his article on childhood leukemia near nuclear power plants at infairly.org. That's I-A-N-F like Frank. A-I-R-L-I-E dot org. And check out our interview on Nuclear Hot Seat number 217, that's 217, right now available on either iTunes or on YouTube at Nuclear Hot Seat Videos. Here's today's final thought. Today is my birthday! Anyway. I can think of no better way to celebrate than by kicking nuclear's butt yet one more time. But recently, one of my listeners asked me about the nuclear hot seat wish list. What did I really want? And I had to admit that I'd never bothered to compile a wish list. Then I thought it through. And what follows are some aspects of the show where I could use help to evolve the content and increase its reach. Much of what I wish to accomplish depends on successfully completing this website recreation and relaunch so that there is a solid, secure platform to send people to, as well as a no-bandwidth charge hosting package so that it doesn't matter how many people come to the site and download the program, it's not going to cost me a small fortune. But beyond that, here are some things where, if you can help, It would be really appreciated to get a crew of people together and let's see what we can do to get Nuclear Hot Seat further into the world. The first thing is that I need volunteer assistance in posting the show on Tuesday nights or Wednesday mornings. This is to help get it out to the usual online channels like Facebook and Twitter. If there were just 10 volunteers taking on 10 different online sites each, The job would get done in a breeze, and I wouldn't spend the last hour to 90 minutes of a Tuesday night trying to get the show out. I'm looking for contact with other online networks that want to carry the show every week, no charge online as long as they're a free show. This is the way that UCY.TV does, and I want to get into that cooperative position with other online networks. Just spread the reach out to get the information out. I'm also looking for contact to community radio stations. These are the small volunteer stations that play only in a little local area, but I know that there are several that I've had contact with that wanted to play the show, and I need to be in contact with them, and more importantly, have someone to serve as liaison to these stations so that their needs get served and don't get lost in the crush of everything else that I'm doing. My ultimate goal is to get this show picked up by a broadcast, cable, or best case possible, satellite platform. So if anybody can help me with that, please let me know. Still looking for contacts to any of the comedy programs that cover the week's news. John Oliver, whom I love to the depths of my being. Trevor Noah, who seems to be doing a good job so far in filling some very big shoes with John Stewart. Larry Gilmore. Stephen Colbert, 
I'm looking to write nuclear jokes, consult on where the comic not-so-funny bone is on the issue, or research stories for them to use on the air. Any contacts will help me get through the door. Beyond that, for the site itself, I need a reliable, dedicated webmaster to monitor the website, update, handle problems, check on security every week, and this would preferably be someone within the anti-nuclear movement. A social media master to structure and help implement cutting-edge online strategies to build the audience. Someone to help create a database of reporters who have covered nuclear issues so that they can be added to the email list and I can be in contact with them in their local communities. Help creating informational videos based on nuclear hot seat stories, little one-minute nuclear hot seat sound bites. A sound box for me and my mic so that I can record without background noises, which I duck away from all the time. Help updating the email list on my server. A cartoonist to illustrate some of the nuclear numbnuts that I have come up with. A travel budget so that I can cover more events live and in person. And, of course, the holy grail. A stipend to me so that I can work on the show and nuclear issues full time. That's the wish list. And I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge some of the people who have helped me get this far, such as Joni Ray and Ms. Milky the Clown, who are responsible totally for what shows up on the Nuclear Hot Seat Videos site on YouTube. So that's the wish list. As someone wise once said to me, their wishes, go for it, don't hold back. So that's what I've done. I haven't held back. If you can help with any of these, send an email to me at info at nuclearhotseat.com. And if you don't have any of these resources yet, just go on Facebook and wish me a happy birthday, as way more than 100 of you did before I even woke up this morning. What a great way to start the day. And if you really want to give me a gift that keeps on giving, invite me into a Facebook Scrabble game with you. That's my addiction of choice, and I'm not going to go to a 12-step program to get over it. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, September 29, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, rt.com, nhk, fukuleaks.org, simplyinfo.org, fukushima underline diary.com, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, japan-times.co, japantimes.co.jp, psr.org, Days Japan, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, wpsdlocal6.com, eastcountymagazine.org, wcsstorage.com, bostonglobe.com, timesfreepress.com, dianuke.org, informable.com, and our esteemed colleague Lucas Hickson, the brain-eating zombies at World Nuclear News, and the dedicated, big-hearted nuclear hot seat community on Facebook, which you, yes you, and everyone you know are invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver, accompanied by John Barnard. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on iTunes under podcasts. Our archive is available on the website, or it will be shortly. You can get it through iTunes or on our YouTube channel, which is Nuclear Hot Seat Videos. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed, as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call, so don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are licking.